In the last video, we took a look at finding the volume of revolution by the method of disks. We now want to turn our attention to revolving regions that don't touch the axis of revolution. This will require that we use the washer method. Let me share my screen so we can get started. When we look at volumes of revolution by washers, we're again talking about this shape right here. So in a sense, it's because the area that's being rotated does not touch the axis of revolution. It actually sort of creates an outer surface and an inner surface, and the solid is between the two. When we're looking at this one, let's look at examples three and four again, but rotating around a different axis. If we look at example three, which we previously rotated around the x-axis, we got a completely solid shape because it touches the x-axis at all points between zero and two. However, if I want to take this shape and revolve it around the y-axis instead, it does touch between zero and one, so it'll be completely solid on the bottom. But from one up to nine, it does not touch. The area to be revolved is shaded gray. And there's white open space between it and the axis of rotation. This is going to create a hollow space on the inside of this curve. Let's now look at example four, which we just rotated, well, actually around both. When we rotate this around the x axis, Notice that this area that's purple does not touch the axis of rotation. Because of that, it became hollow on the inside, sloping down sort of like an arena to a flat open space on the floor. Let's go ahead and indicate the axes of rotation with our curving arrows. In order to find the volume of such regions, you're essentially finding the volume of two shapes, the outer and the inner. And because the solid is between the two, you're going to take the volume of the outer shape and subtract the volume of the inner shape from it. It sounds a lot like the area between two curves, and essentially it's the same idea. We're going to call the inner radius R sub I and the outer radius R sub O. R sub I goes from the axis of rotation to the closest curve that connects one of the strips. Let's draw the strips on example three's picture. Notice here, that what touches it on the left changes from zero to one compared to one to nine. When I'm from zero to one, it touches the axis of rotation. So the bottom will be completely solid. However, from one up to nine, the inner part is given by the parabola. That makes this inner part the inner radius or R sub I. This R sub I is going to carve out the hollow cavity on the inside of the solid. And the outer radius is given by the distance from the farthest end of the strip from the axis of rotation. Inner radius goes from the closest end of the strip to the axis of rotation. And the outer radius goes from the farthest one. Then what I do is I find the volume of the cavity on the inside using R sub I, and I find the volume of the outer surface using R sub O, and I subtract the volume of the cavity from the volume of the outer surface. Looking at this graph over here, because we're rotating around the x-axis, I would instead have to have vertical strips, long and narrow. This distance here from the axis of rotation to the closest end of the strip becomes the inner radius. And this distance here from the farthest end of the strip to the axis of rotation becomes the outer radius. 
we're going to find two volumes and subtract them. You can, in fact, find the two volumes completely separately and then subtract one from the other, or you can compute both at once by having both formulas of A sub X DX on the inside or A sub Y DY on the inside. We are using a disc or a washer shape. Washer shape, again, from the center, which is touching the axis of rotation, which has to be right here, coming through the middle like this. Then we have an inner radius and an outer radius. The inner radius is going from the axis of rotation to the closest edge. And the outer radius is going from the axis of rotation to the outer edge. It's still a circular cylinder, just with a hole punched through it. Let's take a look at some pictures from the text book on how these are formed. Here we can see the horizontal line y equal 1 and the function y equal the square root of x. We want to revolve the region here from 1 to, I believe, 6 around the x-axis. So it is the x-axis that is our axis of rotation. That means we'll have an inner radius and an outer radius. The strip goes on the region to be rotated, the area itself that's being rotated. So when we look at this picture, this distance here is the inner radius, and this distance here is the outer radius. And this creates a washer shape when rotated. And when you revolve it, it creates a solid that has a cavity on the inside. This one has a hollow tube running right through the center. It's cylindrical in shape. And that's because this was a horizontal line. It doesn't really change much about the formula. It just changes the fact that we need to apply it twice and subtract. Let's look at the washer method about the x-axis. This time we have two curves, f and g, and we're going to let them be continuous so they're integrable. And the textbook likes to make them non-negative. You can see in this case that f is drawn above g. And we're going to define r as the region bounded above by f below by g, on the right by the vertical line x equal b, and on the left by the vertical line x equal a. And then we want to rotate this around the x-axis. This is going to create for us an inner radius to the closest curve and an outer radius to the outer curve. The volume of the solid of revolution is pi times f of x squared minus pi times g of x squared. Or you can factor out the pi and say pi times f of x squared minus g of x squared. In other words, find two volumes and subtract them. It can be done in two separate integrals if you prefer. Looking at this picture, we have the identity function y equal x and the rational function y equal 1 over x. If we rotate this again about the x-axis, notice that it does not touch the x-axis. And so we'll get a hollow space on the inside. And you can see over here with the dashed orange line, the shape of the hollow space on the inside created by this inner curve g of x. Let's now look at example five. In example five, we're going to rework taking the same region as an example four, but we're going to revolve it about the x-axis instead. This is the one that we've done previously, but we're going around a different line. Again, it's bounded by y equal e to the x, y equal three, and the y-axis x equals zero. We need to identify the inner radius curve and the outer radius curve. We're going to rotate around x, which is here. 
which means that the distance from there to the nearest end of a strip is the inner radius, and the distance from the axis of rotation to the farthest end of the strip is the outer radius. In all cases, we can see that our inner is the y value on the function y equal e to the x. In other words, r sub i is given by e to the x. Our outer is given by the y value on the line y equal 3, which means our outer is given by 3. Now that we know what the radii are, we need to find the limits of integration. The one to the farthest left is obviously zero because we're starting at the y-axis, x equals zero. However, we don't exactly know what the location of the last rectangle is. We need to know what the coordinates of that point are. We know it's on the horizontal line y equal three, so we know the y value is three. To find the coordinates, take the equation y equal e to the x and set y equal to three. Then switch from exponential to logarithmic form to get the natural log of the answer equal to the power. This must be the natural log of three. Have we identified everything that we need? Yes, we have. We're now ready to go ahead and set up our integral. We're going to integrate from x equals zero, the leftmost strip, to x equal the natural log of three, the rightmost strip. What we're essentially finding is pi times the outer radius squared, and then subtracting pi times the inner radius squared. And it's going to be with respect to x, since our axis of rotation is horizontal, the strips are vertical, and that makes the differential dx. Now we can replace our outer with what we found it to be, which was 3. This then becomes the integral from 0 to the natural log of 3 of pi, which I'm going to factor out now, times 3 squared minus what was that inner radius? The inner radius was given by the distance from the axis of rotation to the closest end of the strip, which was on the curve y equal e to the x. In terms of x, it's e to the x. That means that we need to square e to the x. Don't make the mistake of thinking that becomes e to the x squared. When you have one base, e, and two powers, x and two, you multiply the powers. So that becomes e to the two x power. Go ahead now and pause the video so that you can work out the remainder of this integral. This gives us an integrand of nine minus e to the two x. Because I knew I was going to have to use u substitution on the exponential, I went ahead and split it into two separate definite integrals. The integral of 9 dx just gives me 9x times the pi that was a constant factor. It's evaluated between 0 and the natural log of 3, which gives me 9 pi natural log of 3. To integrate the pi times e to the 2x dx, I have to make the substitution that u is 2x, take the derivative with respect to the original differential dx to get 2, then abuse the notation by swinging the dx around. I don't have a 2 in this definite integral, so I divide by the 2 to get dx equals du over 2. Then I go ahead and make a substitution for the limits of integration. When x is 0, u is 0. And when x is the natural log of 3, using the definition of u, I get u is 2 natural log of 3. 
When I substitute these into the definite integral, I get pi over two times the integral of e to the u du. This is just e to the u, which has to be evaluated from zero to two times the natural log of three. This gives me e to the power two natural log of three minus e to the zero. e to the zero is just the number one, but I have to do a little bit of algebra to work out what e to the power two natural log of three is. I know that if the e and the natural log are back to back and touching, then they undo each other, but this pesky two is in the way and it's keeping them apart. In order to take care of it, I remember that there's a rule that brings the power on the answer part to the front, which means I can do it in reverse and shove that two right back on top of the three. And this gives me e to the natural log of three squared. Three squared is nine, so I have e to the natural log of nine, which now that the e and the natural log are touching, they undo each other and give me nine. That gives me nine minus one, which is eight, and eight multiplied by the pi over two gives me minus four pi. This is nine pi natural log of three minus four pi cubic units, which turns out to be about 18.5 cubic units. And as we saw earlier, it does look like this, sort of an arena shape with an open space on the middle. Let's take a look at calc plot 3D and see what volume it found. When we look up here, we can see that it is very close to 18.5. So we can feel confident that we have in fact done it correctly. Let's now move on to revolution about the y-axis using the washer method. In this case, remember that since we're going around the y-axis, which is vertical, our differential will be dy, and our function has to be a function of y. It may or may not also be a function of x, but what's important is that it is a function of y and passes the horizontal line test. In this case, we are going to have two functions, f of y and g of y. They need to be continuous so we can integrate them, and your book likes them to be non-negative. We're going to define r to be the region bounded on the right by f of y, on the left by g of y here in blue, on the bottom by the line y equals c, and then the top by the line y equal d. Once we have this, then we can apply what we learned earlier. Again, in this situation, the axis of rotation is vertical, which means the strips must be horizontal. Notice that the location of the topmost strip is y equal d, and the location of the bottommost strip is y equal c. The narrow end tells us that the differential has to be dy. Then when we look at the picture, we need to take the ends of the rectangle and find their distance from the axis of rotation. In this case, the inner axis is going to be given, the inner radius is given by g of y, the x value on that curve, because the horizontal distance is measured by x. The outer radius is going to be given by the x value on the f of y function. And when we find the volume of this revolution, we find that it is the integral from c to d of pi times f of y squared minus pi times g of y squared. Or you can factor out the pi, square each function, and then subtract. Remember that the limits of integration depend on the location of the lowest strip to the highest strip. Those give you the upper and lower limits of integration. Let's now apply this formula to example six. We're going to take the curve that we had in example three, and we're going to revolve it about the y-axis instead. And we're gonna find the volume of that solid of revolution. The region is bounded by the parabola x plus one quantity squared. 
by the y-axis, x equals zero, a vertical line, and by the vertical line, x equal two, and by the x-axis, the horizontal line, y equals zero. And we're going to rotate around the y-axis. When we look at this shape that we see right here, we are rotating around y, which means that our rectangles must be perpendicular, which means that they run in this direction horizontally. Notice that as I go from zero to one, the nearest end of the strip is actually touching the axis of rotation. This is going to be an actual disc shape on the bottom, so it'll be solid. However, from one up to nine, the inner radius is given by the x value on the parabola. Notice that the horizontal distance is always given by the variable x. That means that we're going to have to rewrite the equation of the parabola in terms of y instead. We also have the outer radius, which is the distance from the y-axis to the vertical line x equal 2. But that distance is always a constant. It's constantly 2. We're going to have to split it into two different regions because what the inner radius is changes. We're going to split it according to when it touches the axis of rotation and when it does not. To find the volume of the lower part, we don't even need calculus. We could use calculus, but we don't need it. And the bottom, because the radius is constantly two, and you can see the radius right here equal to two, and we know that this distance here is one, then I know that if I take a cylinder of radius one and I find the volume of it, the height is one, well, it's gonna be pi r squared times the height of one, which should give me four pi. When we take a look at it, however, we could also integrate it. Let's take a look at the integral for the bottom region. Again, because the radius is two, we could simply use the formula for the volume of a right circular cylinder to get four pi. But you can use the disk method and replace the r with two since it's always two and integrate from y equals zero to y equal one which gives you four pi y, which again results in the volume of four pi. The volume of the bottom is four pi. What about the volume of the gray shaded region here when we revolve it around the y axis? In this case, we need to identify what our r inner and our r outer are. Our inner is measured to the inner curve and our outer is measured to the one farthest away from the axis of rotation. On r sub i, I need the x value on the parabola, but I need it written in terms of y. For r outer, it's a constant value. It's always two. Notice that the distance from the axis of rotation to the far end of any strip in the upper part is always two. In order to find this, I need to take the equation of the parabola and rewrite it. The equation of the parabola is y equal x plus one quantity squared. In this case, notice that it is on the right arm of the parabola. In order to solve for x in terms of y, I'm going to have to take a square root. Normally, this would give me a plus and a minus. When I do that, I would get plus or minus the square root of y equal to x plus 1. And when I move the 1, I would get negative 1 plus or minus the square root of y equal to x. 
the right arm is given by the positive root. This would give me negative 1 plus the square root of y, which I could write as square root of y minus 1. The left arm of the parabola is given by the negative 1, negative 1 minus the square root of y. It's always going to be that the positive one is the right arm and the negative one is the left arm. If we're looking at a right or left opening parabola, the upper arm is positive and the lower arm is negative. Now that I know that the right arm is given by the square root of y minus one, and this gives me x, then I can write the inner radius as the square root of y minus one. We also need the limits of integration. We found the volume of the lower region. The upper region is from y equal one to y equal nine. Again, if you weren't sure of what the coordinate was here, you can take the parabola and set it equal to the vertical line x equal two. If you were to take the parabola, y equal to x plus one quantity squared, and say that it also intersects x equal two, then you would have y equal to three squared, which gives you nine, the y coordinate of that point. We are going to integrate that part from one to nine. We found that the volume of the lower region is four pi, and we want to add the integral from y equal one to y equal nine of pi times the outer radius given by two, I believe. Yes. So we'll take the two and square it, and then the radius of the inner surface, which in our case is the square root of y minus one quantity squared and integrated with respect to y. In order to solve this one, because we have a square root in here, you're better off to go ahead and multiply it out, simplify the integrand if you can, and then to integrate. Go ahead and pause the video now to complete this problem, and then turn it back on and we'll discuss it. I went ahead and multiplied out the square root of y minus one quantity squared by writing it twice and applying the operation of distribution or FOIL. Then I distributed the subtraction that was between the two terms in the integral. Then I combined it with the two squared or four. The four minus one gave me a three. And I rewrote two square root of y as two y to the one half power. I kept the four pi on the front so I wouldn't forget about the volume of the base part. When I integrated, I applied the power rule for integrals. And this changed what I had and gave me the algebra that you see here. Remember that the three halves power is the square root of something cubed. So that nine to the three halves is the square root of nine or three raised to the third power, which gives us 27. One to any finite power is one. So that gave me 27 minus one or 26. When I combined everything together, I got a final result of 68 pi divided by three cubic units which is about 22, well, it's exactly 22 and two thirds. When you look at the shape that you see here, Calplot 3D had a little bit of trouble drawing the two combined, but you can see that the bottom would be a completely solid disc or platform. Above it, however, the outside is a solid cylinder of radius two, but the inside of it is hollow would hold water or flowers or whatever you want to put into this cylindrically shaped vase. Let's now turn our attention to volumes of revolution around lines other than the x-axis or the y-axis. 
For example, what if we want to rotate around the line y equal 2 or around the line x equal 4? This is going to change the radii. If we, it does not touch the axis of revolution, it will change both the inner and the outer radius. If it does change the axis of revolution, it won't simply be the function value or the x value, but you'll have to take into account that you're measuring to something other than a coordinate axis. Let's go ahead and take a look at this picture here where we are revolving the region bounded by the x-axis and the y-axis and the line y equal 4 minus x. The bounded region is shaded here in gray. However, my axis of rotation, while horizontal, is not the x-axis. It is instead the line y equal negative 2. This becomes my axis of rotation. When I want to draw the rectangles, I again draw the rectangles inside the region that's being revolved. That means because my axis of rotation is horizontal, that my strips must be vertical. And I can see from the picture that they're starting at zero and going to x equal four. When I'm looking at these, this makes the differential dx, since the narrow end of a vertical rectangle is the differential dx. To find the inner radius, I need to find the distance from the nearest end of the strip to the axis of rotation, which is this distance right here. R sub i, in this case, looks to be equal to two no matter where I am in this area to be revolved. In other words, the inside is going to carve out a cylinder, a circular cylinder of radius two. And you can see that over here in the picture that we have a cylinder of radius two carved out of the inside. Now, when we're looking at the outer radius, we need to measure from the farthest end of the rectangle to the axis of rotation. In this case, it would be a mistake to think of this as being the y value on the function. Instead, the outer radius is the y value on the line plus another two. The two because the y value on the line just measures down to the x-axis. And you have to account for the additional distance of two. This would make it four minus x plus two. And that would make it six minus x. Let's take a look now at example seven. In example seven, we want to find the volume of the region bounded by x equals zero, which is the y-axis, and the curve y to the fourth equal to one minus x. Notice that this is not a function of x, but because it passes the horizontal line test, it is a function of y. We're going to revolve this around the line x equals three, which is highlighted here in red. This is my axis of rotation, not the y-axis. In order to figure this out, realize that the axis of rotation is vertical, so your rectangles or strips are drawn horizontally. Go ahead and draw some strips into the shape so you can verify that they're always touching the same two curves on the left and the right. Now let's go ahead and label the distances. From the axis of rotation to the closest end of the strip is the inner radius. From the axis of rotation to the farthest end of the strip is the outer radius. Now we have to figure out how to represent the outer and inner radii. Because our strips or rectangles are horizontal, our differential is going to be dy. If I'm looking at this, I know that the distance from the y-axis 
to the axis of rotation is three. If I'm looking at the outer radius, in all cases, the farthest end of the rectangle touches the y-axis. So the outer radius must be three. However, what is the inner radius? The inner radius is from this point on the curve, y to the fourth equal one minus x, to the axis of rotation. This point right here represents some x value and some y value. This distance from that point back to the y axis is the x value on this curve. And this distance is three. So to find the inner radius, I need to take three and subtract the x value on y to the fourth equal one minus x. That will give me the value of the inner radius. Now, I need to take this function, y to the fourth equal one minus x, and I need to solve it for x since I'll be integrating with respect to y. If I do that, then I can find that x is equal to one minus y to the fourth. And that means that my inner radius is three minus one minus y to the fourth, which becomes two plus y to the fourth. Now I need to know what the limits of integration are going to be. The lowest y value is occurring down here when this curve intersects the y axis. On the y axis, the x value is zero. In order to find these points here and here, I need to set x equal to zero and solve. Since I have y to the fourth equal to one, then I can take the square root or rather the fourth root of both sides and I get plus or minus one. I know that it is intersecting at y equal negative one and y equal one. Now let's go ahead and let's figure out what the volume of revolution equation would be. I'm going to have my limits of integration from y equal negative one to y equals zero. Then I need to have pi times, and I'm going to have the outer radius squared, which is three squared, minus the inner radius squared, which is two plus y to the fourth. My four got a little lower, squared. And this is with respect to y. Now that we have this written down, go ahead and pause the video to work out the integration. Remember that if you want to try to see what the three-dimensional shape is going to look like, you can draw the mirror image of the region to be revolved across the axis of revolution. In this case, the vertical line x equal three, which will give us this here. I know that the closest points would be in the center and then they would kind of pull away. So it's going to create, well, like the thing that holds ribbon at Christmas or something like that. Let's now go ahead and take a look at what this looks like on CalcPlot 3D before we go ahead and look at the integration. You can see that the region is divided here into horizontal strips. And again, over here, we had to set the setting so that x would be a function of y. In this case, you can also see the axis of rotation as a dotted line x equal three. When we revolve one representative rectangle, you can see, oops, I'm revolving the wrong thing, that you get a ring or an annulus. When we see this ring or this annulus and we look at it, then what we're looking at here is of course the cylinder, but we're carving out the inside because it doesn't touch the axis of rotation. Let's go ahead and rotate all of it now. 
if we rotate all of the shells, you can see sort of the way it gets developed. And if we tilt it down, you can see sort of the inside from above and below. Let's go ahead and increase the number of shells so that we can get a better approximation, oops, on the actual volume. When I increase it dramatically, it is taking a little while to get there. We'll have to see when it finally stops computing. But you can see the shape of it when you look at it right here. And again, you can imagine that it is coming in a little bit more on the center than on the upper and lower section. When we integrate, we have to square the outer radius and square the inner radius, which we found to be 2 plus y to the 4. Go ahead and multiply it out and simplify by writing 5 minus 4y to the 4th minus y to the 8th as the new integrand. Then you can apply the power rule for integration and substitute the upper and lower limits of integration. Be careful because a negative one to an odd power is still a negative one, which gives you double negatives inside of each of the applications of the lower limit of integration. When you're done, you end up with 368 pi divided by 45 cubic units, or about 25.7 cubic units. Now, when I did this in CalCLAT 3D, it kept giving me the wrong volume. So I'm a little concerned about that, and I'll reach out to the creator in order to find why that might be happening. Let's now take a look at mixed practice. Mixed practice basically means you're not told whether to integrate with respect to x or with respect to y. You're not told whether to use a disk method or a washer method with an inner and outer radius. This is a more realistic situation. Instead, you have to graph the region on your own, identify the axis of rotation, determine if they touch, in which case you need the disk method, or don't touch, in which case you need the washer method, or sometimes touch and sometimes don't, in which case you need both methods and you have to split it into different definite integrals. Let's go ahead and take a look at example eight. The volume of revolution for the region bounded by the square root of x and x squared about the x-axis. When we look at this particular region, notice that it does not touch the axis of rotation. The rectangles or strips will be vertical because the axis of rotation is horizontal. This gives us the differential dx. Because it does not touch the axis of rotation, I have an inner radius and an outer radius. Pause the video now to solve this problem and then turn it back on so we can discuss the results. I identified the inner radius as the y value on the parabola, and since y equals x squared, the inner radius is x squared. The outer radius is the y value on the square root, or the outer radius is square root of x. I looked for the limits of integration by looking for where the two curves intersected each other. Then I set x squared equal to the square root of x and squared both sides to get x to the fourth equal x. Do not divide by x or you'll lose a solution. In this case, move them both to the left and factor out the common x. Then you can factor the difference of two cubes and get two real solutions, zero and one. The remaining trinomial has complex solutions with an imaginary part. So they are not going to be real values. Then go ahead and set up the integral from zero to one of pi times the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared with respect to x. Squaring a square root gives you x and x squared squared is x to the fourth. Then you can apply the power rule for integration 
and substitute the upper and lower limits of integration. This leads to three pi divided by 10 cubic units. Let's take a look at what it looks like on CalPlot 3D. In this image, you can see the shape to be revolved here, and you can see one representative rectangle which has been revolved around the axis of rotation, producing a washer. Let's now go ahead and rotate the entire region. If we rotate the entire region, we get a bowl of a sort. If you look at the bowl from the side, you can see that the bowl comes down and on the interior, there's a hollow space, sort of like a funnel, and it curves down to a sharp point at the bottom. This part of the, so the solid is solid and the inner part is hollow. Let's now check and see how it did on the volume of this one. Well, I don't see the volume for some reason. Let's take off the representative rectangle and see if it gives us the volume. Still not giving us the volume. Well, we'll have to assume we've done it correctly and move on to the next one. In fact, I know it's correct. And this one, it's a very similar shape. It's also the square root of X, but this time X cubed, and we're going to revolve around the Y axis. Because we're revolving around Y, we have to draw the rectangle horizontally, and the differential will be dy. That means that you're gonna have to rewrite both of these equations as X equals something in terms of Y. And you'll need to find the limits of integration and again, you can set the two curves equal to find the intersection points. Go ahead and pause the video to work this one out. I started by taking my two equations and solving them for x in terms of y. y equal the square root of x becomes x equal y squared. y equal x cubed becomes x is the cube root of y. The inner radius is the x value on the square root function, which is y squared when written in terms of y. And the outer radius is the x value on the cubic, which is written as the cube root of y when written in terms of y. To find the limits of integration, I set the two curves equal to one another and solved. In this case, it gave me x to the sixth minus x. Factor out the common x, which left me x to the fifth minus one. Now I know it has five solutions, but I'm looking for the real solution. And because I know what the graph of x to the fifth looks like, I went ahead and set it equal to the one and took the fifth root to get one. However, I'm integrating with respect to y. So I had to substitute these x values into the equation to get the y value at that point. As it turns out, because of the nature of the functions, the y values were the same. But again, these need to be y values to match the differential dy. Since the outer radius is given by the cube root of y, I rewrote it as the one third power. And I squared it and subtracted the inner radius squared. When I applied the power rule for integrals, I ended up with 3 fifths y to the 5 thirds minus y to the fifth divided by 5, all times pi, and evaluated between 0 and 1. When I evaluate between 0 and 1, I end up with 2 pi divided by 5 cubic units. Let's take a look at what this particular graph looks like on calc plot 3D. When we look at this one, we can see again the region that we're rotating, which can be found right here in this particular slice. And it creates a very similar shape to what we had the last time. It has a hollow space on the inside, shaped sort of like a funnel, if you will. And it's coming out in a slightly more bowl-like way than the previous one, because we're using x cubed and not x squared. 
When I take a look at this one, if I want to revolve it again, I can unrevolve that representative rectangle if I can get it to come down all the way back to the beginning. And then when I look at it, I can see the inside a little bit more clearly. We've reached the end of the material on volumes of revolution by discs and washers. Now that you're sort of familiar with the process, the next technique will seem much simpler. That does not mean simple, it means simpler. In the next video, we'll be looking at section 6.3, which is volumes of revolution by shells, a completely different shape from the discs and washers. I hope to see you in the next video.